Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our class on, um, on the Egyptian chronology and the Exodus and the Kadesh inscriptions. So what I'm going to do is let's first go over our, uh, our chronology. And to give you an idea, let's talk a little bit about where does, where does, it, um, where does the Exodus fit uh, in terms of our chronology and what are the important things in Egyptian chronology that we kind of talk about in relation to the Exodus. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that now. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, just give me one moment as usual. Let's do this, here we are. Excellent, okay, great. Share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, I hope that everyone can see my screen. And of course I can't hear you because you're all on mute because you listened to me in the beginning of the class. Well done. All right, so I'm assuming you can see my screen. Um, okay, so this timeline is courtesy of my teacher, Mark Smith. Mark Smith uh, taught me everything I know about Ugaritic poetry, uh, but he's, all, he's a Bible scholar. Um, and he was, he was great. He was actually on my committee in my dissertation and he was unbelievable. I used to, I was doing, um, I was doing work here and I would FedEx him. I would, I would have the chapters bound, like not bound expensively, but bound like in plastic. I would, I would send them to him and he would FedEx them to me back covered in red. The first time I got it, I was like, oh, but it was just great. Cause he really went into into everything, like you know, if I had a citation that was off or any of your ideas to the to details, and he was just he was just awesome. Um, and one of the things I got from him early on was this timeline. I'm not I don't have the whole timeline here for you. Um, and this it gives a, a, the one thing I've added here is the Egyptian fifteenth dynasty of Hyksos because Hyksos come up so frequently when we're talking about the Exodus. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to discuss the, um, I want to have that in this timeline. And what you can see is, so we're talking, okay, so the middle bronze age, late bronze age, we're talking about late bronze, that is, let's say, so let's say if we want to say late bronze is like the, the, the patriarchal <laughs> period, if we're going to put it in some kind of biblical chronology. Um, but you'll see that the 15th dynasty, the Hyksos, is very, very early on in this chronology which is why it's always nice to point to the Hyksos because also the Hyksos were known as the shepherd kings. So you really want to connect the shepherd kings, the Asiatic shepherd kings to the Asiatic uh, Jacob's family who are shepherds and live in Goshen and everyone hates them, right? Um, however, the time when the Hyksos really controlled Egypt was very early on compared to when we can put anything like the Exodus. Um, of course, they were always a threat to Egypt. There was always this kind of back and forth with these, with the Asian peoples, okay? So it wasn't that it was, there was this one time when they actually ruled and, and then ruled over parts of Egypt, um, but the, they continued to be a threat and considered like a problem later on as well. So it is important to point out the Hyksos, okay? Now, if we move down uh, here, so let's say, um, um, another uh, another character we've discussed was Akhenaten, right? So Akhenaten, just to remind you, and also to those of you who missed that class, so Akhenaten is who we call the monotheistic pharaoh. How monotheistic he actually was is a question, but he certainly did create this idea of an abstract sun disk god, right? That you could kind of only reach through the royal family, even though we do know that people did in fact pray to the sun disk directly themselves. And just this idea, so even if he wasn't completely monotheistic and he did allow, he did allow temples um, and possibly even support temples outside of the um, Amun, the main Amun cult, which frankly was a, the Amun priests had become so powerful, they were a threat to the royalty, which is probably why he did this, right? It's probably the reason why he said, I'm gonna make 
a new religion with me in a very central role and just kind of cut the legs off as it were of the of the Amun priesthood. And of course, as soon as he died, it went back. The, his, his son uh, um, reinstated that the old religion, right? And they wiped him from the books. They wiped Akhenaten off of the books because of course he was a heretic because he didn't worship the correct gods. Um, but it's interesting to say, how did he even get the idea of an abstract God besides the monotheism? This very abstract sun disk, which was not at all personified. Possibly in the beginning it was, because there is one statue with just like this disk as a head that we have. But um, so that, and, and the question is, did he do that because there was some kind of Semitic influence? Um, just to remind you, um, yes, his father had a Semitic vizier, um, a vizier whose name ended in L, right? And was Semitic. Um, however, that Semitic vizier in his own, um, in his own kind of uh, tomb looked like he was as much of an idol worshiper, quote unquote, as everyone else. Um, um, however, there was, there was a lot of correspondence and the El Amarna letters under Akhenaten actually show us that correspondence between Egypt and Canaan and Canaan. There's a lot of back and forth and there's the use of, there are letters that are written as if they're in Egyptian, but they're almost completely in Canaanite, which took them, which is why it was a long time before the people understood them until they realized, oh wait, they're writing in Egyptian, but the words are actually Canaanite words. Um, so there was actually a lot of correspondence between uh, between Canaan <laughs> and and Egypt. Um, and uh, then we have, of course, King Tut after Akhenaten um, and the reign of Ramses II. Now, Ramses II, right, is, the, is we, we put him, he's the guy that we always put with the Exodus. And if you look at the timeline, it becomes clear why. OK, because if we talk about pre-monarchic Israel, if we're talking about if we talk about the monarchy of Israel and Judah. Right. And then we work backwards. We talk we, we in general, we talk about the early monarchy as Iron Age. OK, um, and here we have the pre-monarchic period. And if you're looking and saying, OK, so here, if the pre-monarchic period in Israel is about twelve hundred to one thousand BCE. OK, um, Ramses works like right before that. So it's a very nice, Ramses II fits into that timeline. Now I know they're redoing, there, there are arguments to redo the entire Egyptian timeline. Um, I'm not gonna go into that. I, it, it's uh, far out of my area of expertise, okay? Um, there are every now and then moves to change the entire timeline of everywhere, like here in Israel, you know, let's just move all the archeology span shift everything. Um, um, and of course there is always a problem with archeology, span which is that uh, you build one, once you have one, one um, level of, of archeological finds and that's dated, everything else is dated according to that. So if, if you change that level, what that level means, everything shifts and everything's a, a nightmare. We think of archeology span as an exact science. It really, really is. There are a lot of assumptions made in archeology, span but I'm working on the kind of standard timeline. All right, now the Battle of Kadesh was a battle between Ramses II and the Hittites, okay? Or I should say the Hatti, okay? We like to call them Hittites because we have Hittim, right? But they're the Hatti, right? And they had a major, they had a major um, um, empire. We're gonna look at that in just a moment. Excuse me for just a second here, okay? Um, we're going to look at that in just a moment, but first I want to get the chronology settled. Okay, so so here and then what we have is we have these inscriptions. The Kadesh inscriptions were in we have them in multiple copies. And what's interesting about them, one of the things that's interesting, is that they have side by side a prose account and a poem. All right, which is uh, certainly if you read like Joshua Berman, he talks he likes to compare it with our account of not of the of the initial exodus the exodus and the crossing of the sea and and as yashir the song of the sea right and those two juxtaposed put right next to each other uh particularly since the uh, poem and what's called the bulletin of the of the inscriptions are considered to be from the same time and are considered to be propagated together and 
if not by the same author, then at least ordered by the same king. Okay. Um, then there's a question here. You see, this is where Mark Smith said 1250 to 1200 question mark early traditions of Israel or times, you know, like when is, when are the traditions of Israel coming from? Um, and then uh, the Merneptah and the Merneptah Sili, which we've talked about in different, in a different context where we have the earliest known reference to Israel outside the Bible as being completely cut off and destroyed, right? Which we know, of course, is not true. Um, now here uh, in 1180, the destruction of Ugarit, the, the heyday of Ugarit was back in 1375 to 1175. Um, that's where we get a lot of the Ugaritic text. Now, remember when I said about Ugaritic text, they read like, they read like something much earlier than biblical texts, right? They're, they're, they're um, I need a more politically correct word than primitive, but that's how they read. They're like, you know, um, they're, you, can, you can read them and they're, they're much earlier at the same time. You have certain uh, standard uh, language that seems to pre, like pre, be a precursor of certain prophetic language, et cetera. Okay. All right. So now you can kind of see by looking at, at this, um, at this chronology, you can kind of see why everyone just says, okay, Ramses II is the Pharaoh of the Exodus, because just timeline wise, if we rely on this timeline, that's where it fits. It makes the most sense of Ramses II. And luckily enough, we have a ton of monuments for Ramses II. So like, it's fun to have Ramses II be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. That also helps. It always, it always helps. We also have a lot of stuff from the guy. He has a lot of monuments. So it always helps to like kind of have that, have both together. They're like, okay, there we go. Pharaoh of the Exodus. And then the question of course becomes, well, we don't have any um, evidence, right? So let me actually stop myself for a second. Okay. Um, and one of the, so one of the issues becomes, uh, well, we don't have any evidence of the Exodus, right? There's no account of the Exodus from the Egyptian point of view. And then the question is, well, what would they say right if a bunch of slaves left or were able to leave the answer is they wouldn't say a whole heck of a lot because it wouldn't look very good right so i don't i don't think that that's a big i don't think that the idea that i mean there are other things you can argue about right but the the, the argument from absence here um is uh is i think not a particularly convincing one for me just because because if you've noticed, just if you look at, for example, the Menephtah Steely, the idea, it says, oh yeah, we destroyed Israel. That's it for Israel, right? Except we know that it isn't it for Israel at all, right? It, it's not at all cut off. So in terms of believing in monuments, um, there's a, there are limits and monuments have a certain, um, monuments and in general writing has a certain purpose. It's not meant to just like reflect reality. Okay, now I'm gonna to go to, I see that there's some questions. So let me take a look. Okay, from Moshe Matitya, is Josephus the original source of the theory connecting the Hyksos to the Exodus? Did the idea precede him? That's an excellent question. I don't think it preceded him. I don't think that there was a, anyone connected the Hyksos to the Exodus um, before him because also people weren't thinking that way about history that much earlier and or Jewish history, right, in particular. Not I I I um I don't think I th I think it's just I think he was the first. Um, are the Hyksos a dynasty from outside Egypt or native to Egypt? They are not native to Egypt. They are not native to Egypt. They are what's called Asiatics. That is, they're from what we would call the Near East. They're from like Canaan and beyond is the idea, but especially the Can Canaanite area. Um, and they are absolutely not native Egyptians. It really stuck in Egyptians' craws when they took over. And that was something that did echo, okay? So you can absolutely say, well, this kind of enmity towards anyone from that area, first of all, it was a threat, like anyone on the border is a threat, right? Um, but it's absolutely true also that this, uh, this, this period that they went through and the fact that they had to keep fighting them and there was a point where they were part of Egypt, it, it, was a, it, was, um, it was something that was in the kind of collective memory of Egypt. Um, is it Ramses II at the Abu Simbel Temple? Yes, it is. And we're gonna talk about the Abu Simbel Temple in a bit. Um, 
Uh, plus, of course, the Bible stating that the slaves built the cities of Pitom and Ramses. Yes, the fact that the Bible talks about the slaves building the cities of Pitom and Ramses uh, helps with the whole Ramses uh, connection. Of course, it's a weird, it doesn't really, that, that causes a problem with the chronology. Just the fact that they're building that then, it doesn't make sense so much, but yeah. Are there texts in Egypt associated with Semite slaves? There are, excuse me, there are, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean the mines? They're like Canaanite mines that the Egypts control. Like Egyptian, the Egyptian um, empire kind of extends up, right? So what, what ask, I, yeah, sure. Sure, what I mean by that is that um, uh, as far as I know, um, uh, it is known that the the Hebrew alphabet oh. has its um, has its sources down to Egypt, where you had um, slaves from this kind of this, um, part of the world, which took uh, um, you know their symbols and and uh, yeah, okay. and started writing so, text so, with them. So in the, Egypt. the one that okay, so there's uh, there's there was a mining settlement in the south where they have an alphabet that they think was was created by um miners uh like semites let's say like people from the area working in the mines under egyptian rule they were taking things like like hieroglyphs but they were using them for semitic words right so they would take something they saw that they're using like a hieroglyph that looks like an eye and they take that eye and they make it an eye like that you know like and right. that's and that, that's what was going on there is, um, is there some kind of date on that? Is there, there is a date on it. I gave a class on it, but now I don't remember. And I think that was the class that the sound wasn't good. So the, it's, the recording's not up. Like, but would I, that, would I, that I make sense that. with the with, uh, Exodus narrative? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't, and also they're not, they're specifically mine workers. I mean, they're not, they're not in Egypt is the problem there is an earlier alphabet in egypt like one of the, there's one that i just where's the they they more recently found a a precursor of that alphabet in egypt itself um and i don't remember the date on that one right so the mining one though were which were people who weren't actually located in egypt they were serving egyptians right you know maybe it could be you know but it wasn't in actual what we call egypt now um okay um so good question um the place is called Sirabit al khadem the place in egypt in sinai you're talking about the 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 miners yeah so that's yeah yeah and then they found an earlier they found something earlier but i don't remember from what period like they were like okay that's the earliest this is the miners and they had this great story about it and all these things and then they found something earlier which was like deeper like really into egypt but i'm not i don't remember the whole story with it i don't know how much they know about that yeah but thanks Ido. um okay does anyone theorize about an alien asian hyksos ruler being associated with Joseph as a vizier. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So again, the Hyksos are too early. The Hyksos are too early. Um, the, the vizier, the Joseph vizier connection is more easier to do the chronology if you're putting him in Akhenaten's court. Like, I like that idea. I like that idea. Because it works, it works with a bunch of, okay, indulge me for a bit. So if you have a Joseph-like character, right? And he's in the court of Akhenaten, right? And then you, Akhenaten gets this great monotheistic idea. And he's like, hey, this is great. I can have this abstract God, get rid of these priests, excellent, right? And then it's like, then a new Pharaoh rises, right? Who doesn't know, he didn't know Yosef. And he's like, these guys are just trouble. Well, Akhenaten gets wiped out like what's not instead they're like that was terrible what a heretic and they just wipe him out right so you really have a situation where there's a new pharaoh who's like i didn't know the, the that old guy like i didn't know him right it's not the first time a pharaoh gets wiped out Hatshepsut also got wiped out pretty much but like you know um, um since she was a woman but <laughs> but you know it's it's uh 
Um, I think that's, that's in terms of chronology and in terms of talking about a Joseph as a vizier, that works best for me. If we're gonna, if we're, if we're gonna play this game, that's, that's what I would do. That, that's, that's where I would place, that's where I would place Joseph. Um, okay, so let's move, uh, just pause in case anyone else has any more comments or questions. If not, I will move on to the Kadesh inscriptions. One more, so one more question. One, sure. One more question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, anybody, I'm sure somebody has tried to theorize this, that we are the Hyksos, that, I mean, Near Eastern origin. Um, oh. Um, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's like with Josephus and, and they are, and that's the idea, like also, the whole idea that they're called the shepherd kings, right? So that that's always something that whenever you talk about was the Exodus real, someone's going to bring up the Hyksos, right? Um, and again, I the shepherd king thing is great because it it connects with this whole idea of us being um, of us being um, you know the, of the of the the children, the Jacob's children. They're 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 shepherds. And they come, they go to one specific area, and they're not really, people aren't really comfortable with them because Egyptians are farmers and they're shepherds. And there's that whole cultural uh, distinction between them. Um, so that's, that's, very, uh, that's very central to the story. Um, at the same time, and, and again, you do have ideas of the kind of the threat of the, let's call them Asiatics, right? Uh, you, know, you could say the Ephraim, right? The people from who are across uh, across the border there, right? Um, that threat is absolutely something that's ever present in the in the Egyptian mindset. But um, but again, time wise, it's very difficult to to put the Hyksos rule in. Um, you could see that that's why there would be a lot of negative feelings towards the Asiatics. Even you, but you don't even need that because, frankly, um, you have the whole other. There are others. Uh, the Egyptians are really um, are really pretty. They've got a, a pretty specific culture. They've got their pretty specific people. Um, they are. It's um, they're they're quite distinct from the other ancient from the ancient Near Eastern cultures. And it makes sense that any group, any external group coming in, is never going to not be recognized as being an external group. Um, again, if we look at Akhenaten's uh, the vizier for Akhenaten's father. Um, who is again a Semite um, through his name? By his name, it seems like he's a Semite. He, he rises up pretty high. So there's there's this back and forth, um, and I guess it depends on the period in terms of how acceptable it is to be a non-Egyptian in Egypt. Um, it, it, it's very interesting that later by, by on, the way, by the way, yeah. mm -hmm. go ahead. You have uh, you have a repeat of that much much. M much, much later in history, almost 1400 years ago, um, when the Arab Muslims take over Egypt um, and the Arab Muslims have a tradition in which shepherds and nomads are superior and farmers, the Falachin, are inferior and they take over Egypt, it's, uh, uh, again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a foreign culture being imposed on, on Egypt. Well, it's 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 very interesting the contrast, you know. Um, it's like in, like in the musical Oklahoma, you know, why can't the farmers and the ranchers just be friends? Or I'm sure I'm quoting it wrong, but th that the, uh, the the farmers versus shepherds idea is so basic in biblical narrative that we have the very first murder happening. It connected to it, right? You've got a brother who's a farmer, and you've got a brother who's a shepherd, and like this world isn't big enough for the both of us. And and then you have, and what's very interesting is specifically with Egypt, and I've discussed this before when we were talking about the idea of debt slaves, that um, there's this story with Yosef, when Yosef goes in and he's doing, and there's a famine, and the Egyptians essentially sell themselves and their land, right? And they 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 gradually come to sell themselves in their land and there's no division between them and their land, right? They, they, as soon as they say, they say, take, first they say, sell, you know, they sell everything else first. And then finally they have no more food and they say, will you take us and our land? Take the land and us, take the land and us because we have no existence as free people 
if we don't own our land. So just take the land and like, that's not what they, they don't need to explain it. But the idea is as soon as they're selling their land, they're selling themselves. And it feels weird. You're reading it and you're like, really? And it feels like you are looking at it from a shepherding point of view, right? In other words, you're looking at it from a point of view of people who are shepherds and they're like, really, really? You're selling your land and you have to automatically sell yourselves. And then when you have, and then you have, um, Israel is like a shepherding group. They come out of Egypt with all this cattle, right? Why do they have all this cattle? Because that's it. That's what they are, right? They're shepherds. They keep cattle, right? And that's what something that they have. They live with a lot of cattle that's theirs. It's not the borrowed stuff. That's, the, that's their cattle. And then once they're about to go into the land, they get all these rules that are going to have to do with agriculture. And that's why, as we mentioned earlier, they need the Shemitah rule, the, the, the Shemitah Safim, the rule of um, and the rule of someone can be sold as an indentured slave, as a, as a debt slave for six years max, right? And that's going to prevent this cycle of agricultural slavery, which is such a feature in the ancient world of agriculture, but not for shepherds, right? It's not a shepherd problem, it's a farmer problem. And now that's the problem you're gonna have, right? Um, so uh, any more questions or, you know, um, move on? Well one thing, if I could go back just for a second to the, sure. the Ixos, I, if I'm remembering it correctly, I think Josephus doesn't directly connect the, uh, the Israelites with the, with the Hyksos. He connects the Hyksos with the, uh, the people, the enemy that, uh, that Pharaoh talks about at the beginning of Shemot. That, uh, ah. the, the, and um, I, I think he, I, I don't I don't know if he says it directly, but he uh, maybe it's just my own assumptions. But the the things at, at, when, in the story of Yosef, um, where it says uh, that the Egypt it was an abomination to the Egyptians to eat with the Hebrews, mm -hmm. um, he associates the Hebrews with the Hyksos, not with the Israelites, with the the Hebrews. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And it would be the sort of thing that um, that any, see, that's what, that's what works in terms of, again, like I said, it was very much an Egyptian consciousness that these guys, that guys from who are these, let's call them in English, you just call them Asiatics because you want to be careful about you know, making assumptions, right? They're dangerous. They're dangerous. And it makes sense. He says, okay, we have a whole bunch of them in our land. And they're going to rise up and God knows what they're going to do. These guys are dangerous, right? And also this desire to not eat with them, right? They're not, the, 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 the meat thing is not clear. Like, like Egyptians liked eating lots of stuff. Um, but, but in terms of we're not going to eat with these guys because they're below us, right? That would certainly work with kind of the Egyptian culture. Um, and again, this, this, this idea that they are, they're kind of these dangerous people. Um, that we're that Egyptians are constantly fighting with because again we're talking borders. The word, um, yes. Sorry, no. Just incidentally, the word Asiatic in English has a negative connotation. Um, oh, but I don't mean Asian. I mean when I you say Asiatic. Yes, yeah, no, but Asian. Has, no, but I know, but it has a negative connotation in the nineteenth century. Know, yeah, like I Mark, guess we could call them West Semitic. Yeah, but. Um, but no, but just, yeah, no, no, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying it's coincidental. No, no, it's a good point. It's a good point if that's if that's uh, so. Um, I'm used to seeing that word used. Yeah, I um because saying West Semitic, even saying West Semitic is assuming that they're not coming up from the east. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, when, so speaking of yeah, go ahead. No, 19th century philosophers talked about Asiatic um despotism it was associated ah, with, i see i see i hear you like okay Mark, Mark uses it. Uh, uh, i'm not sure if, but some of the other great philosophers did too and it was asiatic automatically meant uh these oh okay masses and sometimes they called jews you know like kabbalistic asiatics uh it was all just 
like from the way and Jews are whatever they want. Oh yeah, let's talk about the Jews. Yeah, and the Jews too. Like why? Why Jews? Why are you bring us into this? But like, always, always, always. Why not? Why not? But I am going to make a point before we move on. So it, it, we we talked it, we briefly I showed you briefly in the timeline in terms of the Ugaritic stuff. So that's important because a lot of time when people read as Yeshua, where people read the Song of the Sea, they connect it to Ugaritic narrative poetry. And that's something that Mark Smith does, for example. And that's kind of a classic move because uh, in many ways, Ugaritic narrative poetry is, first of all, it's the closest stuff we've got to like Hebrew, ancient, ancient, ancient Hebrew poetry, right? And it's natural that people look for biblical parallels in Ugaritic poetry. Now, something that Joshua Berman's like, oh, well, there's no Ugaritic poetry that has prose next to poetry in this way, like we have the Kadesh inscriptions. But we have very little. I mean, here's my book of Ugaritic narrative poetry. I'm not pretending that every single little snippet is in here, but this is pretty representative. And this is it. And like this much is bibliography. So there's not a lot. We don't have a lot. So just the fact that there's no Ugaritic poetry like this, you know, doesn't mean that we can't connect between, that there wasn't something, that this wasn't a, another known way of writing about things in Northwest Semitic where you would have a prose description and a poetic description. Now, of course, when we talk about, as I shared by the Song of the Sea, we have the prose description of what happens at, at the uh, Red Sea and the, um, and the poem. Of course, another place where we always talk about this is the Song of Deborah, right? Where you have a battle and then you have the poem and they don't match. There are things that don't, they don't agree with each other, right? This one's talking about these tribes, this one has these other tribes. It doesn't match. Um, one of the things that Joshua Berman points out with Kadesh inscriptions is that they also don't match. So let's take a quick look. I'm gonna give you some background. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Give me just a moment. Cause it's always, as you know, takes me a little while. Okay, share. And we're going to um, do this. Okay. And um, let me switch to um, here, what I wanted to show you. Here we go. Okay, Kadesh. Okay, so where, what Kadesh are we talking about? If you see where we are, Kadesh is way up north. Okay, way up north. And not far from Ugarit, actually, you know, as the crow flies. And here is Hatti. You see what a major empire this was. And here we see how Egypt has gone all the way up. And there's a battle at Kadesh, okay? Which Ramses wins. Okay, so this is the battle scene. Um, here we see, oops, here we see. Um, excuse me, just a moment while I do the here. Here we see the river and everyone lying dead in the river, right? And that, of course, is a feature of the poem. All right. Uh, Ramses riding with his chariots, all the dead people, etc. Okay. So this is, uh, this is a battle scene. Let's take a look uh, in the handout um, in terms of, let's, uh, we're going to look at, we're going to go to Abu symbol in just a bit, but right now let's take a look at these, um, the Kadesh uh, inscriptions themselves, um, the English translation, of course. Um, let me see which, so we have, yeah, this is the poem. So you have the poem and it's next to the bullets and text and they appear next to each other. Okay. And here is the poem. And in the poem, what happens is that he is essentially the king goes in and the, the way the battle is described is a little bit different. Um, but in both of them, what the, the king uh, wins pretty much alone, all right? Um, now the despicable fall of Chief Hati along with the mainlands were with him, stood hidden and ready. Okay, there's an ambush. Now his majesty was all alone with just his followers. The division of Amun marched behind him, the division of Free crossing the ford, uh, the division of Ptah, the division of Seth. And then what happens is once the Hati, once, once the despicable rule of Hati stood amidst the army which was with him, 
Um, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, not all of the poem is poetry and not all of the prose is prose uh, in, in, these, in this kind of split. Uh, it's just the po poem is mostly poetry and the prose is mostly prose. Okay, so what happened is, um, is they all his, um, he's abandoned. Everyone, all the whole army kind of leaves the king alone. All right, and then the king is found, is hemmed in by the Hittites or the Hatti. Okay, and then said his majesty, indeed, what's up with you, my father Amun? Has a father ever ignored his son? Now have I done anything without you? Do I not go and stop at your word? How much greater is he, the great Lord of Egypt, to allow foreigners to approach his path? What are they to you, O Amun? These Asiatics, despicable and ignorant of God. Have I not made for you monuments in great multitude, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the stuff you did for him, for, for Amun. Okay, I've called you on you, O Amun. And then what happens is um, Amun goes to his aid. Um, the um, here, I found Amun came, he gave me his hand being with me and I was happy as close as face to face. He spoke out from behind me, forward, I am with you. I am your father, my hand is with you. I am more useful to you than hundreds of thousands of men. I am the Lord of victory who loves bravery. Now remember the hundred thousands, that's something that we have uh, in, in, in the Song of the Sea in, in Nazishir, um, Lord of victory who loves bravery. My heart I found strong, my mind joyful. All I did came off well. I was just like Montu. I shot to my right and captured to my left. I was like Seth in his moment in their sight. Okay, I, I found that the 2,500 chariots in whose midst I was fell prostrate before my horses. None of them was able to fight. Their hearts quailed in their bodies, fear of me. All their arms was, were weak. They could not shoot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens is now the God is on his side and, he's, and he rules and there is a, um, there's a recognition here that, that this king is not just a mere man, it's, he's a, he's a manifestation of the divine. It's Seth, great of power, Baal in person. Um, um, not the acts of a mere man or the things that he does, they belong to one utterly unique. In other words, they're divine. One who defeats myriads, no troops with him, no chariot lead. let's come away click quickly, let's flee before him. All right, so he slaughters them as one would expect. Um, um, and here, uh, I raise my voice to call to my troops, saying, "Stand firm, be bold-hearted." My troops. He kind of rebukes them because they were they were cowardly jerks. Um, now, see, you did a rotten trick altogether. One, not a man of you stood firm to give me a hand as I fought. This, by the way, is not at all like like anything like the Song of the Sea, anything like Azia Shir, um, and or Shiratayam, I should say. Um, um, but I keep on, <laughs> I can't help it. But I was trying to remember calling it Shiratayam for Song of the Sea. And it's, that's the proper name for it anyway. Um, um, and essentially, so here you see that, um, that the God um, um, plays a very central role in this poem. Um, the enemy recognizes that, um, that there's a divine force at will and they're scared and they retreat, et cetera. Um, and then it ends, I'm looking for it here. And then dawn, there we are. Okay, bum, 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 bum. Um, um, and there are also, of course, um, 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 contradictions. He was supposedly left all alone, but he has, his charioteer Mena, his shield bearer and his household butlers, they stayed at his side. We're only finding this out at the end because the beginning he was completely alone. Um, and then in, then Ray and he's appearing at the dawn. Uh, one of them called out to his fellows, look out, beware, don't approach him. Okay, and it keeps on going and going and going and going and going. Um, I'm trying to find where, here we are. Um, okay, and then, okay, and then finally, and this is, this is another one of the parallels, uh, it was the might of his majesty that protected his army, all foreign lands praising his fair countenance, 
arrival peacefully in Egypt, a P. Ramesse great in victories and resting in his palace of life and dominion, like Ray who is in his horizon. The gods of the land come to him in greeting, saying, welcome our beloved son, king of southern and northern Egypt. According as they have granted him a million jubilees and eternity upon the throne of Ray, all lands and all foreign lands being overthrown and slain beneath the sails of eternal land forever. So one of the key thing, things here also is him returning to his palace, right, which is now set up over his land. So if we look for a moment at what are the what are the parallels, and now one of the major parallels is that right afterwards um, we there's there's the um, there's the bulletin and there's the bulletin. Let me hold on. Yes, this is the bulletin text. Okay. And okay. Um, we have the bulletin text, which is alongside the poem, right? And this is simply a description of what happened. And in this description, there is no God. It's the king. The king does everything. So the poem is very much centered on, oh, the God helped me. And, and honestly, and the Pharaoh, it's really the Pharaoh who's divine, right? So the gods help him, mainly Amun helps him. And then he is divine and everyone recognizes, the enemy recognizes he's divine. And there's, there's a divine, it's, there's a divine being at work and they, they, um, they're all afraid. Um, and then, um, and here um, you have, whereas in the bulletin, it's all, you know, there's nothing talking about really divine. It's just how strong the, the Pharaoh is, right? And how, now a note that, so his majesty forced the hostile ranks, the fallen ones of Patti to plunge in their faces, sprawling one upon another, plunging like crocodiles into the waters of Orontes. Right? I was after them like a griffin. I defeated all the farmlands being alone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here we have also the idea of drowning in the river, which is very, very central. Um, and if we look at the, at the depiction, you see how everyone's kind of falling in the river. Of course, a lot of them are dead not being in the river, but drowning in the river is also a part of it, part of the story. Um, if we look at, how did I move through here? Um, so if we look at what is, let, let's, um, there honestly, if you look at Shirat Hayama, the Song of the Sea, the parallels are kind of general and not very specific. Now there is an issue, there is a, a parallel between the idea of Zra Nituya, an outstretched arm, which we have a lot in the whole Exodus story. And, uh, and a word that's used, it, it, that's very common in Egypt, which is, I did it by my strong arm, okay? As, as talking about the, the, the might of the Pharaoh. So the idea, the, the use of Zoran Netuya, of an outstretched arm taking Israel out, really does seem to be a reflection of the way Pharaohs refer to their own strength, okay? But first of all, one of the things you're gonna note here, and we're looking now at, at, at Shiratayama, the Song of the Sea, is, that um, that the um, first of all, it's much more poetic. Seems like even if you read the English, it you 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 get more of a poem, and of course, it's the the rhythm is very uh, striking. Um, and you do have the idea, and and also it's um, uh, there. There's a there's a switch from third to sec to second person in the in the Kadesh inscriptions. There's a switch from third to first um, at one point. But here uh, there are mainly very kind of general, general things. One of them is that, uh, that the, um, the enemy recognizes that it's God, that it's that God is the one who's doing this. Um, they were uh, falsely, you know, kind of boasting. That's kind of a very weak parallel. Um, and then, um, and of course, drowning is part of it. Um, but if you, um, and, and one of the, the main parallel really is that the, the, the um, poet, the poetic account doesn't completely match the prose account, right? In the prose account, in, um, in the Exodus, like the, if, if you actually just kind of um, 
if you just read the poem, it doesn't really say anything about about the uh, about Bnei Israel, about the children of Israel going going through um, on dry land, right? Um, until until the very end, which is not really part of the poem, right? The main thing is the victory over over the enemy. Um, I think that uh, the main parallel here really with like Joshua Berman does a lot. He pushes, let me, let me stop the share for a second. Um, 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 Joshua Berman does a lot in terms of pushing parallels. Okay. Now, honestly, if we look at the actual, you could see from the language, right? Even if we're looking at it in translation, all right? The poem, and this is why people, people are much more likely to look for a parallel in Ugaritic. They look in the Baal cycle, right? So the Baal cycle has these very short, uh, succinct stanzas that are very much like what we see in Shiratayam in the Song of the Sea. Okay, um, 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 uh, then you shall head out to Mount Tarakaziz, to Mount Taharamaj, the two hills at Earth's edge. Lift the mountain on your hands, the hill on top of your palms. And just like that's, it has these short little um, 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 phrases. And one of the things that they look at is like Baal building his home. Cause we know that in, in, in the, one of the weird things, right? in the Song of the Sea in Shiratayam is this reference to God building his house, right? God having his house, his dwelling. So what Joshua Berman says is, look, in Kadesh, it talks about him returning to his palace. Eh, okay, but in it's not that, it, it doesn't seem to be quite the same. Um, in the Baal cycle, it's very, the whole idea of building his house is very central. Of course, the question is, how much should we be looking for these parallels? Let's face it. How much should we be looking for these parallels when we're talking about something that we would expect to be relatively unique? Frankly, first of all, given the paucity of material we have from the area from the um, from the area in general, and also the unique kind of setup of the Hebrew Bible, where you have these prose uh, this prose description with poems in it, and that amount of prose description, that amount of prose recounting. For the ancient Near East, I'm not talking about Egypt now, but for the ancient Near East, it's very unusual. Let's face it, it's just very unusual. It's a, it's, it's, there's, um, if we have, it, it's hard to tell again, because um, we have, we don't have a lot. The Ugaritic stuff is much earlier. Um, the Ugaritic stuff is pretty much all poetry, right? I mean, you have letters, right? But you have, you have, you have poetry, you don't have prose recountings. Whereas the biblical text, and this is why I wanted to do maybe a class on it, but I'm not sure it wouldn't get super, super boring really, really fast. Um, but there's a, a writtenness to the Bible that is unusual. Um, the whole structure of, you know, Vayomer, you know, and he said, we say, and he said, but just as he said, is very non-poetic. It's very prose, right? Um, there are, um, it, we, we see a different grammar used when someone's talking than when the written in the written context. Um, so there's a very uh, different feel in general in biblical text. And this song is clearly in praise of God, period. It's not, it's not saying, oh, now we're gonna recount the history and say how great our leader was. It's base. It's got the basic difference is going to be is going to be very clear because the whole point is a praise of God. Where let's face it, the Kadesh inscription is not. It's just not. It's about the Pharaoh. Okay, it's about the Pharaoh and how powerful the Pharaoh is and how the gods help him. Now, um, uh, it's, the inscription is found in several copies, so I don't know all, all the different places that it, that it was set up as, as monuments. Ramses II was very good at setting up monuments, and this is actually in, in pretty much identical copies in several places, um, which is one of the what reasons that um, Joshua Berman likes to point out and say, look, here's something that we absolutely think is two accounts, the prose and the poem, they don't exactly match up. There are contradictions within them, there are contradictions between them, and yet we consider them to be written from the same source at the same time, right? And presented together, presented together. What, I, what interests me is it's presented together. No one's like, oh, you're lying, 
right? You no, know, that's not, no, this is, this is presenting two different aspects and you're not expecting it to be this kind of literal truth in the same way. Okay, so um, um, now let's go on to a more striking parallel, which frankly is a little bit difficult to deal with in my mind. Um, let me, I'm gonna share my screen once again. Um, and we're gonna look at Abu Simbel. Okay, so where's Abu Simbel? Let me share my screen. Okay, all right, so where is Abu Simbel? You see that I did a nice bit of Googling here. I, I what can I say? I, I worked really hard at it, but look what, you know, when it works, it works. And here's Abu Simbel, okay, it's a temple. And we found some very interesting there. There's it's tons, there are tons of inscriptions, of course, cover the entire thing. Um, and here we see some really, really striking uh parallels. Um, and for this, I'm actually gonna go into Joshua Berman's book. Um, so if we take a look, um, this is from this is from the his Oxford volume, uh, Inconsistency in the Torah. Um, so if we look at this, this is this is kind of this is um, the actual Kadesh. This is this is the Kadesh inscription. No, this is Abu Simbel. So if you look here, and I tried to find a, uh, an actual depiction of this, I wasn't able to. Um, this is the way. Um, this is the way the pharaoh's camp, military camp, is shown. Okay, here's his reception tent, and here's his chamber, and here's kind of the the compound. Right, and this uh, can be compared in terms of, in terms of um, general ratios, and also, and this is actually more striking because it doesn't match up with other temples. Most temples go, most temples are not um, set up in this in this way. Um, but you go where you go where you go west towards the Holy of Holies. That doesn't make sense because east is where the sun rises, and that's where you would normally face. To worship like in the east right and you have that's why you like oh my god they have they're actually facing towards the sun and they're putting their backs essentially on the holy of holies um so here you have um, a similar setup where it's east west where the pharaoh's chambers in the west okay and, and the holy of holies is in the west all right um so that is i uh, it's always interesting to me when there are people who are like believers and they're like, oh, this is great. This makes it much easier to believe. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I really? Yeah. I, I, it's nice to be you, I guess. I, 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 I you know, um, okay. Um, but let's, let's, let's move on for a second. And this, as this, no, ah, this is even more, I have to say, to me, this is even more distressing. <laughs> so this is another, another parallel. Um, and this is in the throne tent, throne tent of Ramses II. Okay, so here we see the reception hall and where the where Ramses is. This cartouche, okay, represents Ramses. Okay, this is his name, right? And it's in the cartouche. So this is Ramses, and on the other, on either end, on either side, he has winged falcons. What does this remind of us of, guys? Let me stop. Kuvim. Right, right. It reminds us of the Kuvim with the, the cherubs and the Holy of Holies, the Kuvim and Kodesh Kodeshim. That's what it looks like, and that's what it reminds us of. And that, and and um again, so he those are two much clearer parallels, right? As opposed to the 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 um uh the the song of Sishiratayam where I really think that it's, you can talk about general ideas and the okay, K drowning and stuff like that. I, I find the, the, the parallel where you have a poem next to prose, that's interesting. But here we have a, an idea where you've got, we, there's this mystery, it was a, it's kind of, it was kind of a mystery for ancient, for, for a lot of scholars, like how did we get the Mishkan, the tabernacle with the orientation that it has? It doesn't match other temples. It doesn't match. Where would this be? So um, to say that it's kind of a parallel. In other words, here is. I, I think the idea. I think Joshua Berman's idea is that here are 
here's an exodus and we showed now that we defeated the Pharaoh. And so when we worship our God, it's going to be like the military encampment of the Pharaoh. Um, okay. I, I, for me, this raises more questions than it answers. I have to say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I didn't, I feel that I need to kind of present it to you guys because, um, but I think, I think there is an idea. I mean, if you want to put it in a religious context, you could say, here's a group of slaves that were enslaved to Ramses II. How are you going to show them that no, you're not, your allegiance is not to Ramses II, it is to God. And so tell them you're gonna build God's camp now. This is the camp for God and this is God, right? Um, um, okay, so, mm -hmm. so that, is, that is a way that you can see it in terms of people leaving Egypt and having to kind of switch their allegiance. And while they don't have a physical God to worship, which is hard enough, in the ancient Near East and all, especially coming from ancient Egypt, let's give them a physical place that they can say, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. This is God's dwelling. And it's kind of like, we all know, because we've, we've seen in the scriptures, we know, or we just know that this is the way Pharaoh has his military encampment. We are part of like the God's military, right? I, I, I grew up going to a Chabad school at Sivot right, Hashem, the army of God, and, and this idea that, you know, and then they camp on all sides of the Mishkan, just like the Pharaoh's encampment, where, where the soldiers camp on all sides of, of, the, of the central camp of the Pharaoh, right? And it's, it's more, it actually makes more sense in terms of particularly given that the Mishkan, that the tabernacle is specifically for going through the desert. In other words, it makes sense that that would be like a military encampment. Like, what are you going to model this on? Well, you're going to model this on something that's royal and moves, right? Um, and so in that sense, it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, okay. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think what we saw is on the one hand, there are some, there are, it's very hard. It's, it's the textual parallels between the Kadesh inscriptions and the, um, and the biblical uh, Song of the Sea are, are very weak. Um, they're just kind of general. The strongest parallel there really is that you have a song next to a prose description. Um, and it's nice to see that that was something that you could have and you can have uh, things that don't exactly match up. And that would have been a standard thing in the ancient world. Um, in terms of the, actually, the parallels between the, um, the camp, the encampment of Ramses II and, the, um, and the, the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle and the Kodesh, and, and the, Kodesh, Kodesh and the Holy of Holies, that's um, somewhat challenging, but at the same time you can understand if you're, taking, if you're talking about an exodus with people who are leaving that, who will no longer consider that a, um, um, consider Ramses their ruler to kind of switch their allegiance um, to God and let's, this his house is this military encampment that we're moving along with. We are, we are moving along with the military encampment of God, as it were. Um, and, and I think in the beginning, when we talked about the chronology, it helps us see why people put this in with Ramses II. When you look at the entire chronology, even though there are different um, um, points that we can point to that also shed a little bit of light on that whole the whole kind of history of of uh, people from not non-egyptians in egypt right hyksos and akhenaten and and then finally we get to ramses ii where we could actually see the possibility of having this kind of a very antagonistic attitude towards a group of people from outside of egypt who are used to being nomadic shepherds. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the class. Um, I'm, I'm glad I got the chance to teach it to you and, uh, and have a good night and I will see you uh, next week.